Well, uh, good afternoon. Um, greetings from the Gaithersburg crew. Um, it's a delight to be with you guys and to be able to, to preach the word. Um, you can go ahead and open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 2. We're going to continue our study together in this book. Um, and as we do, I um, wanted to share, I, I realized my wife was reminding me as we were on the way today, I said, I'm not sure the Frederick Church has heard that illustration. I, I wanted to share an illustration that early on, in the very first few months that Monument started, when we were meeting at Brown Station and only in Gaithersburg, there was an illustration that, that was used about the pig and the eagle. And so stay with me, because this, uh, this was actually a really good one. <laughs> um, and it follows from the words that have been shared as well. When Steve started talking about chains wrapped up, I'm like, this is the exact same thing. It's just a different image. So the, the notion was, the illustration was, if you are a pig, there is no way that you can make yourself an eagle. And if you are an eagle... Why in heaven's name would you live like a pig? That was the illustration. Related to, of course, being dead in our sins, or to use Steve's illustration, being imprisoned by our sin, wrapping the chains back around when we have been set free. The scripture uses the illustration, or the, the um, analogy of being dead in our sins, and then being made alive in Christ. That is, so the, the analogies all break down because they're not expansive enough. They're not drastic enough. So the reason I wanted to start with that is because that's what we're going to get into in this passage that we're going to read in the book of Colossians. It's going to, this theme is going, going to emerge in spades. And I just love how the Spirit's working because of the words that all flow during worship, this is exactly what the Lord's going to bring to our attention today. So um, as we dig in, I also wanted to just reiterate, the book is, of course, a letter to the church at Colossae in the ancient times. So it's very likely, in, in fact, I can't imagine it any other way, that when it was read to them, it was read to them in its entirety. So, of course, we don't have the luxury of the time here, although it would take, what, 10, 15 minutes probably to read the book, but then I would have 10 minutes to preach something to you. So that's like, we, we're not going to read the whole book, but I just want to touch on the fact that it, there is a theme overarching through the entire letter of Colossians, and let's not lose that because it's very important to what we're going to dive in here in chapter 2 on, and that theme is this. The greatness of God in Christ and his reconciling work. It's those combinations. So the, the uh, quote I found in one of the commentaries says this, this combination of the greatness of Christ and his saving work for believers runs straight through the letter. It helps us to understand it if we see that. It makes, continuing the quote, it makes nonsense of any claim that other powers are involved in bringing people to God or that some meritorious practice like asceticism, which is apparently one of the things that the Colossians were, were dealing with. Something like self-merit in some form was going to help make pigs eagles, was going to help make dead people alive in Christ. It, it doesn't work that way. The greatness of Christ in his saving work is all of a piece. So I just want us to keep in mind that's the overarching theme of the letter. And going into this particular passage in chapter 2, um, starting in verse 6, you will see the very first word before we read it is therefore. Therefore is a signal word. It means that everything that came before now leads to what we're about to talk about. So it, in effect, is a, a pivot point or a hinge. Um, Paul has been talking about the greatness of Christ in chapter 1. You can go back and read through it. Preeminence of Christ. Uh, superior over all things, his fullness, uh, over all powers and authorities, that he's in control of all those things. And then, Paul, of course, uh, Donnie was talking to us last week about how Paul made minister to confirm and, um, and, and help to empower and build up people in their faith that we also can draw from that. That wasn't just for Paul to do, it was for us to do as the church and the priesthood of all believers. And fascinating that Paul didn't know these people, and yet he was uh, encouraging them and, and building them up. So we have that. Now we come to this passage, which is our passage for today. Colossians 2, 
We're going to go from verse 6 through 10. So read along with me in this wonderful scripture. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Amen. As you received Christ, so walk in him. So that's, that's the title. It's just right there in scripture. I don't need to make it up. As you received Christ, so walk in him. How did we receive Christ? How did we receive him? This, this, let, me, let me pause before we answer that question. Remember that this is a letter that's written to believers. Paul heard of their faith through Epaphras. So now he's speaking to believers. So this message is to believers. Now, if you're not yet a believer, I have a word for you as well. Because I think it's in Scripture for you too. But I just want to emphasize, this is for primarily us who put our faith in Christ. So the question is, how did you receive Christ Jesus the Lord? Was it of any merit of your own? We know this. We know, we know the right answers, right? If you've been in, if you've been, because I, I, I go to church, if you, if you sit in a car long enough, uh, in a garage long enough, are you going to be a car? No. You go to church long enough, are you going to be a Christian? No. It's not the way it works. Are you going to read scripture, you read scripture enough, if you memorize the Bible, are you a Christian? No. It's not how it works. It's as preposterous as a pig trying to make themselves into an eagle. We receive freely, 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 I love, the, I love the word. I couldn't have made up the, past, the uh, songs you guys sang. The perfect. Free. Free. Forever. What, why? It wasn't something we did. It was Jesus opening hearts, opening eyes. Now let me address. Yeah, hang on. But I did hear the message because I went to a church and that's where I heard. Or wherever, whatever your testimony is. We all have different stories. Mine, I, um, my mother took me to a, a faith club. I was six. And they had this, this wonderful woman had uh, opened her home and she would teach little Bible studies. And I remember the felt board. She would tell us, you know, little Bible stories with felt characters. And then she would teach us scripture to songs. Some of them I still remember, literally. Um, I don't remember the specific moment, me giving my heart to the Lord or understanding the gospel. I don't remember I did it. And it was shortly thereafter I was baptized and the Holy Spirit filled me and everything. It was just an amazing story. My question, the reason I bring it up is, whatever your testimony is, is, is it my credit because I showed up at Faith Club? The Lord uses the means. He opens our hearts. He opens our eyes and our ears. But it's not like we get credit for making ourselves into eagles. Right? So that's why it's so, so important. that we Right off the bat, he's pivoting, remember, the greatness of Christ, and he says, therefore... As you receive Christ, well, we, what, we, let's be really clear how we receive Christ. It was no merit of our own. It was freely God's work to reveal the mystery, Christ in you, the hope of glory, for all, not, the, just, not just the Jews, the Gentiles. Everyone now open to receive the gospel. Yeah, absolutely. Once dead, now made alive in Christ. Jimmy's going to preach about that in, later in chapter 2. And then, because we're now alive, now we're dead to all those old rules. So like Steve was saying, you don't have to go back into the prison, wrap our chains back around our arms. You're not there anymore, right? If you're an eagle now, it is silly to think about it. But work with me here. <laughs> back into the slop of the world and wickedness and condemnation and self-flagellation. Oh, woe is me. I'll punish myself enough and I'll do pen. Really? You're an eagle, man. Fly. Again, the illustration breaks down because it's not drastic enough. 
freely we received, dead in our sins, made alive in Christ. Andrew read, now rooted and grounded in love. And you see that here in this passage as well. Rooted, we're rooted and built up in him. There's an establishment. So when, how we receive Christ, well, we received him freely. And now, now we're supposed to walk in him that way. So it isn't just, okay, you received Christ freely, you didn't do anything. Now that you're an eagle, well, you better get busy. The list is long, my friends. You know, you better be accountable. You better, do, you better be reading your scripture daily, by the way. Meditating and memorizing. Uh, lots of confession. All the, I mean, pick your list, right? And people have done this for the ages, guys. Both believers and unbelievers. And we'll come back to that. Philosophy and empty deceit. But the point is, we receive Christ freely. We walk in him freely. Freely. That's how we walk. We live that way. It isn't just by grace you're saved. It's by grace you live. There is a treasure in that. And what is the beautiful thing about Colossians is it is thick theology. When you read chapter one, it's like, whoa, okay, I get it. Christ supreme. All right. What difference does that make for me? Guys, this is it. This is the pivot point. As you received him because of his supremacy and fullness, so now we walk in him, in his supremacy and fullness. In him, in him, in him. It says in him in this passage four times. You think that might be important. In him. In who? In Jesus, of course. The Jesus who is supreme over all things. The Jesus in whom deity dwells bodily, fully. That is who we live in. So there is a grace and a joy and a freedom in that that I just can't, the words fail. <laughs> they are, it is so immense. It is so amazing that as we received him freely, so freely we Walk. Rooted, grounded, built up in him, established in the faith, abounding in thanksgiving, the passage says. Abounding in thanksgiving. Think of that word abounding. That is not a casual word, right? You know, we, I can tend to be very casual with my thanks. Oh, hey, yeah, thanks for having me over. Or, you know, I'm not really thankful today, so I may or may not say thanks to anybody. You know, I mean, it's not casual. It's abounding in thanks. Why? Why would that be an appropriate response to being made, once dead in sins, being made alive in Christ? Having received Christ, now walk, having the freedom to walk in him. Oh, no wonder. No wonder we should be abounding in thanksgiving. We are just the recipients. God, we just receive. We receive his love. We receive his grace. Then Obviously, it's, it, it naturally follows, just logically, does it not flow? Then our lives should be characterized not by casual things, not by occasional things, abounding in thanksgiving. It bursts out of us. People are like, what is up with those guys? Exactly, because we have received unbelievable grace and treasure in being made alive on no merit of our own. And now we get to walk in it. Okay, so, but life's not all rosy over here walking. We have challenges. We are still in the now and the not yet, to Corby's word. We're not home in the absolute sense of the word. We are redeemed and we have been made alive, but we're not with Christ. We don't see him. Yet, in full, we see him in part, Paul talks about. So, this is where the next part of the passage draws our attention. We are looking at verse 8 now. And this is an echo back into uh, verse 4 in the same chapter. Where Paul, I was talking about, I don't want you guys to be deluded with arguments. And so now he's picking up that theme here again, in the context of how you received Christ, now, so now walk in him. So, how it says, see to it, see to it that you are not cap taken captive by philosophy and empty deceit. A lot of words, and there's a lot more coming. If he says, see to it that you're not taken captive, then by definition, it is possible to be taken captive. So the reason I highlight that is because I think often, especially the longer you've been a believer, 
And the more you know your systematic theology, the less that we can pay attention to these warning signs because the sign is a war the word is a warning. See to it is strong language. Taking captive is strong language. Steve was illustrating, you know, taking myself captive. I'm wrapping the chain back around because I think I should be here for whatever reason, self-punishment, any number of reasons. And I've been there. Guys, we've been there. But there's lots of other reasons that people eagle, who are eagles come back and sit in a slop trough. It's, we, we can be taken captive by what the scripture calls philosophy and empty deceit. And then it goes further, comma, according to human tradition. Ah, now I'm starting to understand what all these words mean. Philosophy and empty deceit. According to human tradition, then goes further. Elemental spirits. What is that? There's a little footnote. should be in your scripture. If you clip the footnote, it says elementary principles or worldly principles. Basically, the notion is worldly way of thinking and worldly rules. Okay, so all of those words, human tradition, elemental spirits, think worldly principles. Think how pigs live. That's how, they, that's how, that, that's how people, the vast majority of people process life, is that way. And not according to Christ, who we just read, how you receive him, we walk in him. So that, that's the contrast. So I thought it would be helpful, and we're thinking through this. This was obviously written to the church in, Colossian, uh, in Colossae in ancient times. We are obviously in 2021. What would um, it look like for them to be taken captive by philosophy, empty deceits, human tradition? And then what would it look like for us? What it was appealing to them that is also appealing to us? Because I think that's what is intended, the Lord intends for us to take from the scripture. And I, one, one example of that, I realized that it was going to be very difficult to try to... <laughs> philosophy, just take philosophy for example. Um, the word philosophy is uh, a reference to the study of general, fundamental questions or problems about life. That there's nothing wrong in and of itself, philosophy. It's not saying don't think, okay? So that's, the scripture doesn't say don't think. What it's saying is philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition. There's a way of thinking about these general fundamental problems that is very unbiblical, very ungodly, and will lead us astray, even if you're an eagle. It will lead you back into wrap the chains. It will lead you back into sit in the mud. Too many of God's precious people live this way. Let that not be us. And that's the purpose of the scripture. See to it you're not taken captive. Guys, you've been made free. You've been made alive. So I thought it would be helpful to take one particular um, area or topic, a problem that we face in life and walk through it. What would that problem look like if we were to interpret it according to human tradition? And what would that problem or issue look like interpreting according to Christ? So the one I picked was pain. Pain, suffering. Eric spoke to us recently, talked about the fact that we are the reality of our lives in differing measures and in differing ways. We're broken aren't we? We're dislocated. Follow the thread back in all of human history. Where did pain and suffering begin? Where was the first breaking? Where was the first dislocation? The garden, the garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, and the fall of man, the first sin, and all of the um, consequences of that, which is significant pain. And then all the pain that follows. Guys, we experience so much pain, not just as a result of our own inactions or failures, but often, and in, in I would say probably the majority, is the result of the brokenness of the world around us. And the fact that it's a fallen world, we get sick, we get tired, we get hurt, we get in accidents, people abuse us, people are unkind to us, we're unkind in response, and there's so much pain and so much suffering. So okay, so that's a philosophical problem. That is a fundamental general question, is it not? How that even exists is a big question. And we don't have time to unpack all of that. The message, my point of the message is not to focus on pain. I would just want to use it as an illustration for now 
showing how do we avoid being taken captive by thinking in human ways instead of according to Christ. This example. Okay, so human ways. Well, pain, human tradition, all of history, all of known time, is to be avoided. We avoid that like the plague. <laughs> Nobody I know deliberately goes after that. And if they do, even the ones who say, oh, I'm ascetic, I'm deliberately self-flagellating, whatever, you're doing that because you want to get somewhere else. You're not doing it just for the pain. It is meritorious in your mind. Does that make sense? And I do think that's something the Colossians were dealing with. We find out later, Jim will preach in the, uh, later in chapter 2, they were dealing with rules and trying to follow rules on top of having been already made alive. No, do these rules too. So pain is something to be avoided, according to human tradition. It's something to be resolved, usually by our own means. And any means necessary, we try to resolve it. And there's also this element, I'm not going to be comprehensive, but there's this element of, in a human tradition, the human way of thinking about pain is that in some way signifies either failure, failure on your part or failure in general, and rejection. So, pain according to human tradition, according to the elementary principles of the world. Get out of it, get out of it as fast as you can, do what you can, and if you don't, you're a failure. How many of us have felt that way and thought that way? Me, and I'm a believer. And is it wrong to want to get out of difficult situations? Of course not. I don't want to stay there. Here is now the according to Christ. All right, so stay with me. According to Christ, pain is an opportunity to trust God. Oh boy, is that a platitude? Really, preach? You're going to trust God. Okay. Stay with me. As we received Him by no credit or merit of our own, now we get to walk in Him. When that walk involves a stumble and a fall and a knee break and a replacement or a broken relationship or a broken dream. Or you fill in the blank, whatever you're thinking of when I said pain and when I said suffering, whatever came to your mind first, we receive that grace freely. Now we walk and in the middle of that too, it's not according to human tradition. It's according to Christ. And according to Christ, he is with us. And we're in him. That is our hope. The hope is not avoid, resolve, and get out so we look good. The hope is, Jesus, you're with me. You're in me. This hurts, and it doesn't match what I expect of you. But I'm trusting you anyway. Scripture is full of that treatment of pain and suffering. It is not wrong in the sense of failure and absolute rejection. Too many times we, we view pain and suffering as like, oh, you must be being judged by God. Really? Listen to this quote from Jared Wilson. The way God ministers to the broken is contrary to our expectations and desires. We tend to think his ministry involves only the removal of pain. But this is not the only way God works. In this Sorry, in the same way that the crucifixion, itself a consequence of a sinful world and a dark culture, was victory over sin and darkness, our brokenness itself, our pain itself, is the means of apprehension of the riches of the gospel of God's love. Where we always look for and request deliverance from suffering, the testimony of Scripture is mostly about what God wants to do in our suffering. We prayed before um, the service in Gaithersburg, and John Garrett just prayed, and this was, he didn't know I was would preach about anything. He just said, God, just teach us how you're in it and over it. Man, I love that. He is in it with us, and he's over it. He's not subject the way we are. He's not constrained the way we often feel. He's in it, and he's over it. Guys, this is according to Christ, not according to human tradition. See to it that you're not taken captive by the human tradition, by the worldly principles. 
There's so much freedom in that. And if we are taken captive and we do catch ourselves like Steve, bringing that chain back around, sitting in the slop again, move over here because this is where you belong. And there's freedom to come there right away because he's already made us alive. Oh, so encouraging. This theology, this theology, the study of God, Colossians is high theology. It is very, I mean, you, you cannot read chapter one and come away thinking, oh, Jesus is some average guy, right? I mean, it's a big deal. But what I love about this passage and this letter as a whole is the theology plays itself out in real life, in our day to day. Properly understood, the greatness of Christ is at work, not only making us alive and reconciling us, but then establishing us in faith, rooting us, growing, helping us as we step by step and stumble and pick ourselves up and work with one another and encourage one another. That's the Christian life. This is the Christian life. So lastly, verses 9 and 10. Paul cannot help but repeat himself. And we know from reading Paul that he repeats himself often. Uh, So all of chapter 1 it is, gets referenced in a very uh, compact way here in verses 9 and 10. Again, a lot of words, but let's unpack them briefly. For in him, the whole fullness of deity, that is God, dwells bodily. I think this is Paul doing a big old stiff arm to some of the human tradition and worldly principles. That Guess what? I just finished saying Jesus was supreme and all you need. All of God was in him as a man. Stick that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> like, seriously. Like, I think that, I, I can't help but think, like, part of the people in classroom is like, boom! Remember this, right? So that, that's what that, you got to feel the, feel the passion in the passage. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And, pivot, verse 10, and you have been filled in him. You, guys, us, we have been filled. You know, Ephesians talks about being filled with the Spirit. The Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, we've been filled with him. Paul talked about, in just the earlier verses, I struggle with his energy, which works so mightily in me and in us, because we've been made alive in Christ. We are enlivened in him, literally. You've been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Nobody else has more power and is in charge any higher. There is no one else. There is not a higher authority. So I think, again, Paul correcting uh, whatever was challenging the church at Colossians. Guys, don't buy into these human traditions and worldly principles. There is no higher authority. There is no higher rule. There is no additional do this also in order to be the eagles you are. There is no additional, oh, you must also do this to make yourself alive. (laughs) My, um, one of the guys in my wedding, uh, which was 22 years ago, um, it, we've since um, changed circles. You know, when, you know, life goes on. He's a dear friend, but I don't get to see him very often. But this past spring, he had a cardiac event. That's what they called it. I don't know if it was a heart attack, but he stopped breathing. And uh, his wife, this was, you know, you can only imagine what that would feel like. Uh, this was late in the evening. She had to do, uh, start doing CPR. I don't even know if she was trained. She was doing CPR. 15 minutes later, the ambulance arrives. They take him into the hospital, and it was touch and go for, I don't know, seven to 10 days. Finally came out of the induced coma, and they had to do all kinds of other interventions. He has a device now. It's not a pacemaker. I, don't, I can't explain all of it. My point in bringing up the illustration at all, and I did ask his permission to share it, was that when he stopped breathing, There was no credit due him for being resuscitated. That was it. Had Jess not stepped in, that was it. Had the emergency services not arrived, that's it. He received freely, he received freely, literally, breath and life. And now he's up and about and he is walking. And let me tell you, that man is thankful in a way that I am not thankful. 
every time I have seen him, and I've been able to see him three or four times now since, which is unusual, just for whatever reason, I just exuberant. Guys, that should be us from this passage. We, we receive Christ freely, so we walk. And in light of that, boy, would that help us to not be easily taken captive, yeah? By the human traditions, by ways of thinking, even in the face of very real and very legitimate problems like pain. Guys, there's lots of others. I wish I had more time. I had four others to, push, to, to share. <laughs> there's no way, I don't have time. Just pain. There's, but there's many others. Let's not buy into the human tradition and the elementary principles and the worldly principles. Oh, I mean, this is what I think is right. Man, Christ overall and in us, in it and over it. Like that sticks with me. You remember that, in it and over it. He's in it and over it. Whatever your situation is right now, the struggle, the pain, the difficulty, suffering, in it and over it. That's us over here, right? So let me close. I said I was going to speak to both believers and unbelievers. This is primarily for believers. This is a word to encourage us as believers. We need to be encouraged by this because I don't know about you, I often get sucked in over here, even in subtle ways, human tradition, worldly principles, ways of thinking. And it feels right because, of course, I want to get out of the pain. Who wants to stay in that? But it's about more than that. According to Christ, our eyes are on him. Chapter 3 is going to talk about having our mindset being heavenly and not earthly. It's a reflection of this. There's so much richness in the passages and in this whole book. So my word, just in summary, the application to encourage us as believers is be who you are. Freely you received in Christ. The transformation is greater than from a pig to an eagle. It's from dead to alive. So be alive. Be there. Don't wrap the chain around. And when you catch yourself doing it, walk right back over here. Lord, I did it again. And thank you. You also paid that price for me on the cross. In the middle of your pain was victory. So in the middle of my pain, I'll look for your victory. And if I don't see it the way I want to see it, worldly, I'm trusting you anyway. Because one day, he's going to wipe every tear away. That's Christ. That's according to Christ. So that's my encouragement to you as believers. Now, if anyone has not yet put their faith in Christ, I'm so grateful you're here. I don't presume that I know where anyone's heart is. But here's the word for you from this scripture, and it is for you. And it's a challenging one. If you haven't put your faith in Christ, if you have not turned from your sin and trusted in him, then you are still here, trapped in human tradition and worldly principles. You can't even see to it that you're not captivated because you are completely captivated. That's the way the scripture describes you. And I'm not trying to insult you by saying it. I actually think these words are a means of God's grace to break into your heart and show you the chains you, or bind you right now and no longer to need to hold you. The death that surrounds you in this space, you don't need to stay there. But it's not going to be by credit of your own. It's God who works in your heart. Maybe through these very words and through this very scripture, you'll be made alive. And I invite you to respond to that, to turn from your sin and trust in him and then live in the freedom of having received Christ. Guys, all of us are the same. We are all broken and dislocated, and we receive Christ freely. No one here has more credit for any reason whatsoever. It doesn't matter how long we've been a Christian. None. We are recipients of grace freely from God, and now we live and walk in it. And we get to do that together, and we get to do that with you. So if you've not yet committed your life to Christ, I invite you to do that in response to this word. Amen. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you so much for the sheer power of your word and this truth. Uh, Lord, we thank you that, um, that we, once dead, now made alive freely by your grace. Um, Lord, you open our hearts and you open our eyes. Pray you do that again, even for any among us uh, that may not yet have made that change. Lord, have made that commitment to you and have opened their hearts to you. Um, Lord, I pray that you would work in magnificent ways among us who are uh, faith-filled believers, trusting you. Lord, I pray specifically for those among us, whatever the struggles may be, what those may look like, major or minor, 
that we would be confident of your presence and your fullness and your nearness in and over whatever our suffering or pain may be. And that we would not be taken captive by a worldly perspective on that, but instead live in the freeness of what you have given to us through Jesus Christ, in whom is the full God, the full deity, full supremacy, all fullness. And Lord, may we just been able to walk then abounding in joy and thanksgiving. I pray even this afternoon, and even this evening as uh, church gathers uh, and, and um, gets to celebrate and just fellowship at Baker Park, I pray just a marked thanksgiving and joy amongst us. Even in the middle of circumstances that are legitimately trying, God, I pray you'd bless each and every person here and just empower them to see themselves as who they are, having received Christ Jesus the Lord freely, so able to walk in that way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.